on FM, online, DAB Digital Radio, and Freeview Channel 734. This is BBC Radio Northampton. So you've seen Get Carter, yeah? An amazing piece of work. Michael Caine, Ian Hendry, Britt Eklund. Jack Carter returns to the North East with vengeance on his mind. Get Carter was released 52 years ago today, produced by the late Michael Klinger, whose son has created a new documentary that he finished yesterday to celebrate the movie. Dirty, sexy and totally iconic. Tony Klinger, how nice to see you, Tony. Thank you. It's been lovely. And I'm just coming through the snow, but I would come here for you, Bernie. Oh, now stop it. <laughs> stop it. Well, you've come with your hay fever. I how on earth do you get hay fever in this, man? I don't know how I manage this, but I would like not to have it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Give it back whence it came. Oh, yes, I, I, I could rather... Well, as you said, it could be like tree spores or mm. something. Some it is this thing. time of year, but it would seem implausible, really, in today. But you never know. Counterintuitive, yes. But what I'm saying is, whatever you've got, keep it that side of the desk, my friend. Keep I it that keep, side. I'll keep well away from kissing range. <laughs> you had uh, already started your own amazing career when Get Carter um, was created by your father. You were working on the Avengers first off, weren't you? I was working on the Avengers, and then at that time I was making documentaries. I started making documentaries at, at that juncture from when I was about 17. I was working in the daytime on things like the Avengers, and night time I would borrow equipment, uh, <laughs> in quotes, that they didn't know I was borrowing, and I would go and make my little documentaries, and they got bigger and bigger, and at the time of Get Carter, we were making one that later won at London Film Festival called Extremes, which is still available at the BFI, and uh, we went, and on our way, we were supposed to go to Glasgow filming, our own film, and... The finance and distributors thought we were in Glasgow. We stopped for one night in Newcastle while they were filming Get Carter at the invitation of my dad and Michael Caine. And we had such a good time. We stayed for a couple of weeks and pretended we were in Glasgow. <laughs> so when you have spoken to the people for the purposes of Dirty Sexy, um, how do they look back on that time? Because Sir Michael loved it, didn't he? Yeah, the, it, no question there was... Um, it was an iconic moment in the careers of all the three major Michaels in the film. Uh, Mike Hodges, unfortunately, just left us in uh, recent times, a couple of months ago. And my father, Michael Klinger, and Michael Caine, obviously. And it was it was kind of a seminal moment in terms of not just their careers, but in, in society at large. It was a turning point. And in film, wasn't it? Because British film was in something of a slump. A total slump. Total slump. At that point, I remember at one stage, just soon after that, I was in the Pinewood Studios and happened to run into my father, who we were working separately, and we were at the urinal, and he turned to me and said, do you realise we're the only two people making films in England today? And, and literally, there was no one else making a film at that moment. And what it did was it became a template for um, film and for TV. If you look at Lockstock, if you look at The Gold that's just been on BBC, if you look at Sweeney, all routes lead to Get Carter. Yeah, I mean, the British gangster film noir type of filmmaking all goes back to Get Carter. It was the granddaddy of them all. And your dad's background, you did a great uh, film, a documentary on your dad. Um, what was his background to get him into film? Had it been a family entrenched in entertainment <laughs> no. and in theatre? No, no, no. He, his father was a tailor's presser from Poland, uh, and he was a first generation Englishman, and he was brought up as the son of a tailor's presser, and he was very bright, did brilliantly at school, and became an engineer. And in the war, he volunteered. In fact, I found out after he died, he volunteered eleven times. And was arrested on one of the occasions. They said, we've told you before, you're in a reserved occupation. Go and be what you're supposed to be, an engineer. And he did that. And they didn't let him out for a long time because what he did, some of it was kind of confident, secret, secured stuff, uh, involving inventions of various things. And he then, at the end of it, was like 1950, was the time he got out. He had no money. Uh, he was getting paid like nothing. And so he was desperate to make money. So he then did all kinds of crazy things. He invented the first domestic toaster. And I remember my first memory... Your dad invented the toaster? Yeah, as a functional thing for mass production, yeah. And he, 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 
<laughs> he, he, as he explained it, because he'd been used to working to tolerances of a thousandth of an inch in his engineering. I think it was a thousandth. And then he had to subcontract for the people to make the parts to put together. And these people, like you said, couldn't get closer than a quarter of an inch. <laughs> he said, and my first memory was when we were living in Hackney, which is where we, I was born, and he of him soldering, trying to solder these bits together <laughs> because he had an order for the toasters and, and they didn't fit. And so he, he made them fit somehow or other. And then he went and his his parents-in-law, my, my grandparents, on my mother's side, they made coats, I think, for like child's duffel coats for CNA. And he said, look, you, when, you, when you do things like that, you can get a thing called the cabbage, which is the bit that goes, if you cut the material perfectly, you might have some left over to make your own coats. And that you could keep. That was called cabbage. And he said, I could sell those in the market. You know, I'll get a market stall. And we can make, we'll make some cash extra for, for your factory. Well, factories, a fine word for what was a sweatshop. <laughs> and he did that. My second memory was the hoisting this stuff on a pulley from the top of the house in Stoke Newington to the bottom so they could go in the market and so he was working like a dervish and then he had concessions in the Isle of Wight and Ventnor and it, if we didn't have enough staff I, I now realise I was a little boy he's, he's, he put me in charge of the ice cream stand which was a very bad idea because <laughs> I like ice cream a lot uh, and he, I said, I didn't know what to do and he said just put your hand out and there was marked up the prices no one ever cheated us <laughs> They'd say what they wanted, I'd give it out the fridge, and people give me money, and I'd put it away. And and it was a different world, a very different world, uh, inventor in those days. And then eventually, at the markets, Shepherd's Bush Market is where it was, somebody said there's, who was doing at night times, a bit of comedy, a bit of singing, said there's a club in London that's maybe up for sale, would you partner with me because I've got no money? Well, my dad didn't have any money either. <laughs> So he said, well, let me go and try and talk a deal with the man. And the man's name, if I remember rightly, was Billy Belitho. And my dad, it tweaked in my dad's brain that Belitho had a bank, Belitho Bank in Cornwall, and he, which later got uh, taken over by Barclays Bank. And so he went to the man who was no part, he was part of that family, but he was not a part of the bank. He said, would your bank lend me the money to buy your club? And so he got the people that were selling him the club to lend him the money to buy the club. Wow. And he, which he did. And that was called the Gargoyle Club. And there's a whole load of stories about that, which he hated. He hated, he hated doing it. He hated, so he would do the day times and the other guy would do the night times. But did he like Soho? Well, he came from Soho. Right. So he loved Soho. Uh, but he just didn't like the whole club thing. And he, he then... Got an offer, offer. Somebody said there's a there's another building possible in Old Compton Street. Would you be interested in making that into a club? And so he went and looked at it, and it sort of looked okay. But somebody said to him, maybe you could turn it into cinema. And that was the beginning. Wow. That was how he got into the film business. So he came in it at a not much different time to me, but from exactly the other end. I came in through technical and creative. He came in through business and creative. He came in through toasters. That's he came in came through in. toasters, yeah. <laughs> well, he was an extraordinary man. He, like, anything he did, I remember somebody said, oh, yeah, well, your dad was a kid. He could have been a concert pianist. He could have been this. He could, could have been a rabbi. He could have been... Like, whatever he touched, he could do it. Well, Michael said of him, Michael Caine said of your dad, that he was a, a portly short man, and you'd have thought he was a bit of a comedian, which he was... But he knew the art of filmmaking inside out. He was completely shrewd. And that's where that comes from, being streetwise, doesn't it? Yeah, he, he, he particularly, I think his, one of his greatest strengths was he was a great listener. Another one of his great strengths was he wasn't a great writer. He could write a speech or something, but he wasn't a great writer. But he could make you write to the best of your ability. Was he a hustler? Because that's an American thing. The British film industry, the mainstream, it was not like an independent going out and getting the work. Is that what he did? Well, I think he had a continental view because of his parentage. So he, he kind of didn't wasn't shy about talking about money or deals. Didn't occur to him that that was counter artistic freedom or that kind of thing. People would assume because of just his avuncular nature that he was a, you know, a crass commercial kind of guy. He actually, if you look at the films he made, as he got 
more and more powerful, he was making very, very artistic, creative films. Well, he was doing this fantastic stuff from the kind of maverick experimental side of filmmaking with Roman Polanski, and then Carter comes along, and then he does uh, um, the so-called sexploitation movies that were hugely successful. Um, and uh, get Carter, what have you got for Dirty, Sexy and Totally Iconic? Well, we've got the lot. We really, we really were... It was tough because of COVID. I mean, it was tough for everybody during COVID. And we, no, no, no one expected that. And so we thought we'd finish this like a year ago. But unfortunately, the circumstances put, uh, put, put us in a position where we literally had to fight to go out and get people to come out and meet us because they were terrified, uh, including my wife. Um, and so it was that was hard to arrange. We were testing every morning, every night for COVID testing. And that... It was a big pain for everybody, and not just us. And we managed to get everybody we wanted, but it took a while. Um, and some people, one or two people, were scared to actually meet in person. What he created, what you all created, was um, this sexy, cool film about something that isn't sexy or cool. It's, no. it's, it's terrible, you know? I never, ever thought, and still don't, of uh, Michael Caine as being a sexy actor. But there's a coolness to him in this, as there was, I suppose, in Alfie as well. Yeah. Um, the scene where he, it's a little scene where he comes out and he's, uh, it's early morning, so the neighbour is getting the milk in and he's there with a rifle yeah. and uh, she's, uh, doesn't realise what's going on. She turns around with this bottle of milk, sees this half-naked man <laughs> with the gun, drops the milk. It's very funny. Well, it's very funny. And I think he, the, the best scene for me in the film other than perhaps the telephone sex scene, which is a, a dramatically brilliant scene, was the scene where he's seeing it, well, his niece or maybe his daughter in the porno film, and he's not, you don't see the film, but you see his reaction to it. And his piece of acting in that is just superb. Uh, beyond, I never thought he could do that. I was surprised at his ability to be both angry and violent and simpatico like that and you have michael in the film in the yeah, documentary yeah we do and uh, i wanted to point out that what our film is about is my journey of i wanted to analyze it was 50 years when we started the thing and and i wanted to find out what it was about the film that made it such a iconic long-lasting huge success did it take off from the off was it a flyer or was well, it a slow happened, burn? It's, it's, it's interesting. There was an article published today from an American journalist, literally today, I just got it, which goes through the box office of the film around the world. And we, we, we knew it had done brilliantly in England. We knew the UK had been a hit. But we'd always been told by the distributors, oh, it didn't do well in America, it didn't do well here. And we've now found out it was a total and utter fabrication. It did well everywhere. Well, someone was taking the money then, weren't they? Well, I dare say the company's got more money than we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it's what happened in those days. So when we're going to see Dirty, Sexy and Totally... It's a great title. Dirty, <laughs> Sexy and Totally Iconic. We, ha well, we, As you said, we finished it yesterday. We start the publicity and things start in the next couple of weeks and you'll be seeing it in the next couple of months. It won't be long. You're proud of your dad? Oh, I'm hugely proud. I, it, everything I do, I think, is comes from uh, hopefully my ability but also from my love from him and the things I learnt at his footsteps. We're proud to have you amongst us, uh, Tony. Thank you very much.